attention it Wednesday. Okay, again, a very good morning. Today is the uh, 14th of uh, February. It's a Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. So that today is Valentine's Day. So what we are going to see, first of all, the history of Valentine, and then I would explain, and I would answer already one question that Lynn and Kelvin asked me this morning. And then we will see what God has to say. Uh, Okay. Okay, so that's a five minute thing. So we will see that in five minutes and then I will explain out and correct some things that needs to be corrected in here. For many people, Valentine's Day is all about romance. If you may ask the person in the street, what does Valentine's Day mean to you? All it means is heart-shaped boxes of chocolates and a nice dinner with your with your beloved and, and sending cards and so forth. And then if they didn't know about St. Valentine, they probably wouldn't realize that he was a priest in the late third century in Rome who was actually martyred for the faith. Very often legends will develop from real facts. There's that little phrase in, in J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings where he says, uh, history became legend and legend became myth. The legend of St. Valentine is a story that is rooted in fact. There are three stories surrounding him and they all agree on a number of issues. It seemed that he was born in 226 in a tiny little city called Terni in Umbria in Italy and that he was either a priest or a bishop. Valentine apparently lived during the reign of the Emperor Claudius II. He's sometimes referred to as Claudius Gothicus. Now, this emperor did not reign for very long, maybe a year and a half. Rome at this point in time was really a cesspool of immoral behavior. Pedophilia was rife. Sexual promiscuity was rife. And, and one of the great witnesses of the early church is that they stood up for the value of a godly man where uh, sexuality was channeled into its God-given um, boundaries, and it would become a witness of what enduring love could look like. During his reign, Claudius issued an edict that made marriage illegal. There was an invasion of Goths towards Rome, and they needed a lot of people to go to war. And it seemed that the rule was that once you were married, you were given freedom not to go to war. And... Um, Valentine would not only convert the people, but secretly marry them so that they could indeed stay at home. Valentine was arrested and brought to Rome. While he was being held captive, he presented the gospel to his jailer, the judge Asterius. So the judge said to him, well, if this indeed is true, I want you to prove it. And he brought one of his adopted daughters who happened to be blind, the one legend says, and what happened is that Valentinus or Valentine here laid his hands upon this girl and she was healed immediately. Another legend says that before he was executed, he left a note for the girl signed, Your Valentine. Some say this led to the practice of sending Valentines on February 14th, the day he was beheaded. All the legends seem to agree that uh, Valentine was martyred on the 14th of February in 269. Therefore, that was the day associated with him when the church would celebrate and, and thank God for his life. So Valentine's Day didn't start out as a romantic holiday. We do need to recognize that this day, the 14th of February, was already connected with Valentine from the 4th century, already from that time onward. And right from the beginning, this celebration had more to do than just the celebration of romantic love. And the church's commitment to Valentine to honor this example of Christian marriage and sacrifice and martyrdom and the healing of other people and the spread of the gospel was from the beginning a commitment to what Christian marriage could be like in our world and the message that it brings to a broken world. Valentine's Day represents more than flowers and candy. 
It's about what's in our hearts and the heart of Christ. When we see those hearts on Valentine's Day, we can remember that that heart is also has some connections back to the heart of Jesus and to God's love for us. And we can remember that the source of all love and the source of self-sacrifice and, and love for each other is rooted in God's love uh, and, in the, and in the witness that St. Valentine actually made for that love. For Christians, marriage is more than just the union between a man and a woman. For Christians, marriage is a holy parable of the love of Christ towards his church. It's a visible sermon about what holiness and purity could look like in our lives. We should celebrate what true sacrificial love looks like in a broken world. And ultimately, it should be a day that we celebrate the commitment of Christ who gave his life for his church. It should be a day of evangelism. It should be a day where we celebrate the power of true love to change our world. It is a Christian holiday. Okay, now, so that is the background of um, Valentine thing, and I will need to correct some of the things that are there. Uh, okay, now, I would address first of all the question of Lynn and Kelvin. Uh, the question of Lynn and Kelvin was, is Valentine's Day not glorifying a man, seeing God performed all uh, miracles, uh, not him? Okay. And then the other question is, uh, uh, Stephen um, and many others were also martyrs uh, for Christ and performed the mighty miracles, but we don't glorify them. Okay, so I would address uh, this, uh, this thing, because sometimes when we don't know what the founding fathers were trying to do, so we take the baby with the... the water uh, the bath water and throw it all uh, together now let me go back uh, let me open a big uh, um, big bra big brackets and go back to the the word of god what the jews also did uh, to to commemorate an incident happened and then they decided to commemorate that incident every year in remembrance of what uh, that man did or that woman did so that they can uh, not because of that person the commemoration was not because of that person it was to tell themselves the story why that person was willing to sacrifice what in christianity if you've not found the cause worth dying for you've not started to live yet so they were commemorating uh, some people, not that person per se, but to remind themselves of the sacrifice that those people made for the sake of their personal belief. And we also should emulate those people and have those same convictions because the problem with Christianity today, we have zero conviction. And if you have zero conviction, you would fall for anything. So that's what they did. So when we go back to the Bible, we have in Judges chapter 11, from verse uh, 30 to verse 40. And Judges chapter 11, from verse 30 to verse 40, is the story of Jephthah. Jephthah made a vow to God. And he said, uh, if, you, if I go to war and you give me the victory, when I will come back, I would give you uh, whatsoever uh, comes out of my house to meet me. He thought it would be maybe his donkey, his dog that would come to meet him, or maybe one of his servants. But to his surprise, when he came back home, it was his daughter that came to welcome him. And he started to weep. He was sorrowful that my daughter, you don't know which vow I made to God. What vow I made to God? I said to God that the first person that comes into my house to welcome me, to welcome me I will uh, dedicate that person to God. So uh, the daughter said to me, okay, since you vowed it to God, you cannot break your vow. So I will need to keep that vow and not to marry for, my, uh, for the entire life. So she, went, she spent a month uh, to weep uh, with her friends and then came back. And then from that, reverse 40, 
of uh, George's 11, she decided now uh, to remain uh, single to end a virgin her whole life because of the foolish vow of, uh, of a father. Now, every year now for four days, Israel would commemorate uh, the daughter of uh, uh, Jephthah for the sacrifice she made because of the foolish vow of uh, her father. It was also a reminder, don't make a foolish vow to God that you have no intention of, uh, of uh, performing. So it was a lesson to everyone, a warning to everyone, and uh, the poor lady suffered for the foolish vow of, uh, of her father. So Israel was celebrating that uh, um, uh, commemorating uh, the daughter of Jephthah every year for four days, they would go and mourn for her, or the, the virgin, they would go and mourn for her for four days. So Israel was doing that. It was not because she, they were, they were not praying to her. They were not praying to her, but they were commemorating her and reminding themselves, what you say to God, you need to perform it. So don't say something that you have no intention of performing. Another commemoration that Israel was uh, doing, it was uh, at uh, Tzom uh, Gedaliah. So, or the fasting, the fast of Gedaliah. That is in Jeremiah chapter 40 from verses 7 to verse 9. Gedaliah was uh, the governor that uh, Nebuchadnezzar put uh, um, over the kingdom uh, of uh, Judah. He, killed the king, uh, put off the eyes of the king, carried the king in the Babylon, and put his uh, cousin, uh, Gedaliah, as, uh, the, as the, the, the governor of Judah. But on the third day, day of uh, Tishiri, uh, uh, one of the months of, 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 uh, the, in the Hebrew calendar, Gedaliah was uh, killed. So the people were, uh, he was assassinated. So the people were in so much uh, terror that uh, Nebuchadnezzar would come and kill them all. So they decided to fast, to commemorate what happened to uh, Gedaliah. In Jeremiah chapter 40, verses 7 to, to 9. So Israel is still observing the fast of uh, Gedaliah up to today. God did not remove it. Jesus did not remove it when he came back. So they also learned, it was to draw the lessons. They also, there's another uh, uh, fast also, or commemoration of celebration as well, is of, uh, they call it uh, Tanit Esther. So what is, this is the fast of Esther. So they commemorate what Esther did. Uh, bravery, uh, to stand, to put a life in danger, you say, if I perish, I perish. So fast with me for these three days, and I'm going to see the king on the behalf of the whole nation. I know it is not permitted for me to see the king without an audience, because only one he has only one decree that uh, he would behead the person that comes to his presence without a decree. So I'm, I know that I'm putting my life into my own hands, that uh, there's only two way out. Either he extend his scepter so that uh, mercy will be granted unto me, or I'm going to be beheaded. But if I perish, I perish. So they commemorated the, 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 that day up to today for Esther. Not because they are not praying to Esther, but they are commemorating. And to, it is to remind ourselves that at what cost your life, you need to see a bigger picture. It's not just about, just about the whole kingdom, God's people. So you no longer live for yourself. For you to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you are living this life now, it is for Christ to advance his kingdom. And even if it has to cost your life, stand on uh, the truth of the word of God so that the people of God can be saved. So they commemorated the, 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 uh, those days for those people, what those people did, but they were not praying to those people. The error that uh, we fall into, we start praying to those, uh, uh, to those people. Uh, that is wrong. Like we've explained in the of prayer, we don't pray to any saint. We don't. We pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. So our Father what in heaven, not uh, Saint Valentine who is in heaven, not the uh, Saint Paul who is in heaven, not Saint Peter who is in heaven, our Father what uh, in heaven.
So that is the thing that we need to uh, stop praying to saints or praying to angels as well. We don't pray to angels. That one is addressed in uh, uh, Abessa Diabo prayer already. But uh, back now to our Valentine. Once we've established what the God allowed so that people will not forget what happened and uh, to them and uh, what is how other people stood for the truth of the gospel. Valent, uh, in those days, so that he was born in two, 226 and he died uh, in 269. So between 42 and 49 years old, that's when he died. So there was no Catholic church in those days. There was no Catholic church. So those pictures that you are seeing, they are wrong. People would appropriate uh, Christian history and say it is theirs. No, you, uh, there was no Catholic church in those days, but the, the, uh, there were Christians for 300 years, Christianity has continued. The apostles and so on and so forth, they continued, the disciples continued. And uh, Valentinus or Valentine in English, was one of the disciples of Jesus in Rome. He was a bishop, not, not bishop the way we are seeing that in the Catholic Anglican Church, no. The bishop was just an overseer. Uh, Timothy appointed the bishop, the evangelist appointed the bishop. He's overseeing a church that is there is overseeing. That's why he could marry. So he was not, he was planning to marry that lady that uh, he opened the, the blind eyes, uh, Julia, the name of the lady. So. It was not the bishop like the Catholic Church designed if defined. It was the bishop like the Bible defined in the book of uh, Timothy. So the Catholic Church uh, has started to happen when Constant, uh, the Emperor Constantine became a Christian. That was in 313 AD. Valentinus died already in 269. The Catholic Church was not existent yet. So one need to have a point of correction there. But what he was doing, he was standing for the truth of the word of God and nothing else but the truth. In those days, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. Homosexuality that we are seeing today, pedophilia that we are seeing today was happening even worse in the days of uh, Valentinus in Rome. So pedophilia was, was there, and today we are seeing all, all those pedophiles in Rome and all over uh, the place. It is nothing new. And uh, say, you mentioned sexual promiscuity. So what does it mean? So uh, one night stand practices, living in fornication with someone that you are not marrying that person, uh, being indiscriminate about uh, the choice of uh, your sexual partner. So you can uh, sleep with a man, you can sleep with a woman, so you can be bisexual, you can be homosexual, you can be lesbian. So that's what was happening in those days. There is nothing new under the sun. It's, homosexuality is, uh, is old. Lesbianism is old. Bisexualism is old. There is nothing new. And that's what was happening in the days of uh, uh, of uh, Valentinus, and he decided, you know what? Uh, we need to stand for Christian marriage. We need to stand for Christian marriage. Now, the the Emperor Claudius uh, Gothicus only reigned for uh, from September two hundred sixty eight to January uh, 270, so one year and a half, that was his reign of uh, Got uh, Claudius uh, Gothicus. And the problem that they have, those Christians, they were true Christians. They were obeying Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse five. A true Christian would obey this word. So Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse five, when you get married, God exempts you from uh, war. Uh, you are not supposed to go to war. You stay for a whole year with your wife to, to make her happy, to cheer her up, uh, to enjoy her to the full in the name of Jesus. So they were obeying Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. That's how Christianity 
can it change uh, the culture? The problem is not looking for um, what Christians are doing today. We are trying to have our MEPs converted and then they would go and change the laws there. If the people, the Bible says, like people, like a priest, like people, like a priest. So if we get uh, enough people converted, the, the, the society will change. And that's what Jesus told us and commanded us to do. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. So how will we do that? The more we convert the people, the values of people also change. Because now they are Christian. They don't want to be living in sexual promiscuity anymore. They don't want to do one night stand anymore. They don't want to be bisexual anymore. They don't want to be homosexual anymore. They don't want to be lesbians anymore. They don't want to be also unequally yoked with unbelievers anymore. So you change the value of uh, a whole nation. You start with your own family, your whole community, your whole nation, and the whole empire. So this uh, king now, uh, this emperor, Claudius Gothicus, discovered that uh, even the Deuteronomy chapter 24 has crept into, into the laws of uh, the empire. So he wanted to stop it and he wanted to stop Christian marriage all together. That's when now Valentinus stood up and he started to marry people in secret. He said, don't live in sin. Don't be living in, uh, uh, how do you call it, as a concubines, but come, I would marry you in secret. He started to marry them in secret, in secret, in secret. Just a big parenthesis. Christianity was so effective in converting people that in uh, 313 AD, Christianity became the uh, there were more Christian than pagans that even Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. And that's when now he made it as a state uh, religion. That's when now the Catholics uh, came. Uh, so that was in 313 because the emperor became uh, also a Christian. He said, I impose my, my, my faith on my whole uh, empire. So we change a kingdom by changing the people. It is not by changing the leaders because the people are appointed by the, the leaders are appointed by the people. That's why I will say, I say like people, like a priest, like a people, like a king. God says, I'm not going to punish uh, the, the people because the leaders are the same. They are just representing the people. So our job is not to be praying, God, send, a, send Mike Pence uh, who is a Christian in the White House. That's a wrong prayer. Uh, we've seen what uh, the, the, the results are, have been. If the people are not changed, it really does not matter. Even if we put a, a Christian there on top, we need to change the people. So that our, our job is to save the souls. That's why Valentine's about saving souls and standing on the values of the written word of God, of especially Christian marriage. So Valentine's was willing to die for Christian marriage because he understood that uh, Christianity, uh, uh, in Christianity, marriage is God's holy institution. So what are your views and your values about uh, marriage? Are you willing to put your life in jeopardy because of your belief about the marriage or you truly don't care about Christian marriage that I can live in fornication? If you are living in fornication and someone is giving you, it's not your Valentine, that's not what Valentine was believing. If you are two gay people giving one another flowers or giving one another two lesbians giving one another flowers, that's not Valentine because pagan always take what Christian did and pervert it. That's what Satan always does. Valentine was not standing for any fornication or any adultery or any homosexuality, lesbianism, none of that, or one-night stand. 
no sexual promiscuity. That's why he was even against the decree of uh, Emperor Claudius uh, Gothicus. He married the people in secret. So, which is to say, even in the midst of the pandemic, where people are being forbidden to have big gatherings, this is the time of Valentine again. Like we said, this is the time of uh, Elijah. This is the time of Valentine again. You don't need to wait to have a crowd to attend your wedding. Take the pastor, go sign at the registry, and let them bless you even in your own house with the two people. That's it. Be in order with God instead of living in fornication. And that's what Valentine was doing. And because of that, they arrested him. And they asked him on the 13th of February, 269, they asked him to recant that he should, if he recant, they would allow him to leave. But if he continue with uh, his belief of marrying Christian in secret and so on and so forth, he would behead him. He said, I believe this word. I'm willing to die for Christian marriages. The way God ordained it, in this book, not the way you pagan want to pervert marriage. And because he refused to recant, the night before that, the, the daughter of the judge, the judge said, before that, the judge was saying to him, Why are you so adamant about your faith? Does even your God exist? He said, My God exists. It's not just about marriage, but it's a real. So the judge had an adopted daughter who was blind. So he brought the adopted daughter to, to, to Valentine and Valentine prayed and the blind eyes of that the adopted daughter were, were opened to show that the God that the God that I believe is a real God, is a living God. And because I have a true testimony, I don't just choose to believe. That's what we are doing. We only choose to believe the healing part of the word of God. We are selective about our truth. I just want the healing, but I don't want to follow God's principle on marriage. The Bible is a package. Either you take everything or you take nothing. So you want the power of God to heal the sick, cast out devil, but you don't care about the Christian marriage. I, I can marry a pagan. I can live anyhow. It really does not matter. No. Valentine believed that if I believe in the healing, I also need to believe in the Christian marriage. If I'm willing to die, for the gospel, uh, for this, to save the soul, I'm also willing to die for marriage to be done God's way. So that night, after that, the blind eyes of that, uh, that, that lady, were the Julia, were opened. He refused to recant on the 13th. And then people were praying for him. The, all the couples that he married in secret, they were praying for him, praying for him. And they would come at, uh, behind his self they will be throwing flowers to him because he married them. So they were praying for him. And the night on the night of the 13th, when he before he died, he wrote down to Julia a letter. The whole content of the letter, we don't know it properly. But at the end, he signed your Valentine. On the 14th of uh, the, uh, February, that's when he was uh, beheaded. For his belief, not just about the healing and deliverance and raising of the dead, but also for his belief on marriage. Because he knew marriage was ordained by God, and uh, no secular government is supposed to legislate on marriage. And they are not supposed to tell us how we are supposed to do marriage. In the beginning, it was an idea of God, not of man. So number one, that the thing that uh, Valentine was believing and that every Christian need to believe that God is the one who instituted the marriage. Marriage is the holy institution of God. Malachi chapter two, verse 13, the Bible says that uh, marriage is God's uh, holy institution and we should not profane it. We should not defile it by living in fornication, by living in adultery, living in homosexuality, all that is profaning God's holy institution. And he said that Malachi chapter 2, verse 11, uh, okay, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel 
and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of God, which he loved. Uh, Judah, Judah has profaned uh, his sanctuary uh, by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. When a Christian knowingly goes and marries a pagan, God says you have defiled his holy institution. Christians are not only supposed to marry Christian. From the book of Malachi already. So when a Christian goes and marries a pagan, you have profaned or you have defiled God's holy institution. Number two, the thing that uh, he believed and that Christian needs to believe that uh, is uh, we honor the institution of marriage. We, the first thing that we need to honor is the institution of marriage, the way God designed it. And then after that, we can uh, honor the, the, those, the couple that is being married. But unfortunately today we are honoring first of all the couple that is being married when actually they have profaned the institution. In the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse four, he says, marriage, the institution, the holy institution of God, is honorable among all or should be honored by all, but, uh, and the bed undefiled, because fornicator, uh, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So, by marrying the pagan, we are profaning and defiling God's holy institution. By living in fornication uh, with a man or woman that before we are married, even if we are Christian, which many Christians are doing, we are also defiling the marital bed. By living adultery, we are also profaning, it's an abomination all to God. But today we don't care. We don't care. It is all about now the day of celebration that I will put the white gown, uh, I, I would invite 500 people to my, to my wedding feast and so on and so forth. A true man of God, a true man of God will be weeping because God's heart, the church no longer has the heart of God. We no longer have the heart of God. We stand for nothing these days and we are falling for anything. Because he says he would judge those who are profaning his holy institution. He would judge the, uh, the fornicators, the adulterers, uh, the homosexual, uh, the euphemist. Now, Paul tells us already, now, the third thing that we need to believe, these are just the foundation of Christian marriage for which uh, Valentine was willing to die. Not for himself, but he, because he was not married. I was willing to die for those principles for the Christian faith. Don't compromise Christian marriage. Don't be like the pagans that are pedophile and that are living in sexual um, promiscuity. Let us do it God's way. The third thing that we are supposed to believe as a Christian, all of us about Christian marriage is uh, that uh, we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, he says, do, uh, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what a fellowship has or communion has righteousness and lawlessness? And what communion has a light and darkness with darkness? And what accord has a Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? You are a believer, you go and marry a believer. You are a Christian, you go and marry someone who is not a Christian. You have Christ, they have Belial, they have a Buddha, they have Muhammad. Which is not the same God we are serving. You are equally yoked. And what agreement has the temple of God with the temple of idol? The house of God and the house of Buddha, the house of God and the mosque, we have no accord at all. For, uh, for you are a, live, a temple of the living God, as God has said, 
I will dwell. God dwells in you. You are not God dwells, as we saw last uh, two Sundays ago. God dwells in you, and God walks among uh, them. He says, "I will be the God, and they shall be my people." Therefore, he says, "Come out, come out from among them, and be separate," says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So Valentine was not for Christian to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, or for Christian to be living uh, in fornication without them being married. It was not for one night stand Christianity. So if someone, a man is bringing you flower and he wants to have sex with you, it's not your Valentine. He's a devil. In the house of Belial, you are light. He's darkness. You should have no fellowship with him and no agreement with him. It's not a Valentine. No matter if he buy, buys you uh, a dozen of roses, it's not your Valentine. That's not the Valentine that died for Christian marriage. That's the corrupt Valentine. That's the, the son of the devil. So, uh, the, the number four thing is uh, marriage is important to God. May, and it should be important to us. Marriage is so important to God that uh, the Bible starts with marriage. Chapter 2 of Genesis, it is the, the wedding of uh, Adam and Eve. God, God was there, but God said to, to himself, no, it is not good for man to be alone. I would make a help and meet for him. The Bible starts with uh, marriage in Genesis chapter 2. The bone of his bone, the flesh of his flesh. There was no preacher. There was no prophet. There was no apostles. There was no uh, church building, but there was marriage. To show you how important marriage is in the eyes of God. The ministry of Jesus, the first miracle that Jesus performed was uh, in marriage. At the wedding of Canaan in, uh, Cana in John chapter 2, that was the first miracle that Jesus performed, turning water into wine. To tell us that uh, like, like Valentine understood, it was not about opening the blind eyes. Though God opened the blind eyes, God was more concerned about marriage. So though Valentine opened the eyes of uh, Julia, he could say, oh, I love Julia. Let me just recant all my belief before the emperor uh, Claudius uh, Gothicus, and then he would release me, I would marry uh, Julia. But, the foundation of Christian marriage was so important to him, just like it was important to, uh, to, to Valentine that he wrote a letter, I'm sorry, Julia, but I cannot recant. The emperor decided that if I could just recant, take back my belief and say that I was wrong, then he would release me, then I can be with you forever. We can be together and happy. He said, no, I refuse to recant my Julia. I love you, but uh, I'm willing to die. Your Valentine. Opening of the blind eyes, opening of deaf ears, causing the mute to speak, all that is good. But that was not the first miracle of Jesus. The first miracle of Jesus was at the wedding. And the Bible ends with a wedding. The wedding of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. When God the Father would marry Christ to his church, the body of Christ. It starts with a wedding. It ends with a wedding. The ministry of Jesus starts with a wedding. His second coming is our wedding. It is very important to God. And it should be important to us. Point number five. I'm telling you, and I'm telling myself, if you and I have not found a cause worth dying for, then we have not started to live yet. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11, he says, They, the saints, 
like Valentine and today it is you. They overcame even the emperor Claudius Gothicus and all the other evil uh, Nero emperors by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not recant. Here in England, Tyndale was uh, burned at stake for his belief because he printed the Bible. People died for this book. What they believed in it, they were burnt at stake. Even in England here, Tyndale was burnt at stake by the king. They overcame that king as well, that English king as well, by the blood of the Lamb of Christ Jesus who died on the cross for them, by the word of the testimony. And it goes on. We always stop there. We should not stop there. If we stop, if Valentine stopped there, he would not have accepted to die. But they believed the Bible literally. And he continues and says, and they did not love their lives to the death. It was not about Valentine's anymore. He could have gone out. The eyes of Julia are now opened. I can marry her. So let me just recant. What, what about this Bible? God, I will serve you in secret. But the Bible says, if you are ashamed of me before men, I also will be ashamed of you before my father and, my, and his angels. So he found a cause worth dying for, this book, his Christian beliefs. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 12, verse 25 to 27, and he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And wherever I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. And many other martyrs have been honored by God because of the belief. For Valentine, it was his belief about the, the standard of the marriage of Christian. For Tyndale here in the UK, it was the belief that every Christian is supposed to have a Bible in English in their own hands. He was willing to be burnt as stake by the King of England. And for many others that have been martyred. For Peter, it was his belief. He was willing to be crucified, the head down and the feet up. For John, it was his belief. It was, he was willing to be boiled in oil and exiled into the Isle of Patmos. They did not love the life to the death. Now, point number six, we should stop insulting the spirit of grace. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. What we are doing, we are insulting the spirit of grace and we are trampling the blood of Jesus on the foot. If you are a Christian, you already know that you are not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. If you are a Christian, you know that you are only supposed to marry a Christian. So by you deliberately going and marrying a pagan, you are insulting the spirit of grace. You are trampling the blood of Jesus on the foot. Valentine was not willing to do that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 to verse 30, he says, do not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. This is the assembly of uh, our, ourselves together. We come on Sunday, we come on Wednesday, and any other day of the world we assemble to teach one another the truth of the word of God. Because my people perish for lack of knowledge, one and two, because they have rejected the knowledge. And by so doing, deliberately rejecting the they are insulting the spirit of grace and trampling the blood of Jesus under foot. So do not forsake the assembly of one another, uh, as is the manner of some, but exalting one another, and so much as uh, so much uh, the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, if we sin willfully, we know that we are not supposed to do that. We know that we are not supposed to live in sexual uh, promiscuity, be uh, doing the one night stand, uh, living in fornication, living in adultery, and uh, being the pedophile, uh, being the homosexual, being the lesbian, all those things that uh, Valentine stood against. And we know that, but we go and deliberately, willfully, we sin after we have received the knowledge, not that we did not know, we've received the knowledge of truth. Then Paul is telling us the truth, and Brother Jerry is also telling you the truth. There is no longer, there no longer remains 
a sacrifice for your sins. But what remains is what? Because you willfully and deliberately rejected the, the word of God and you went and did as you pleased. But there is a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation uh, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be the uh, fourth worthy who has trampled the Son of God on the foot? Counted. So what you are doing, you are trampling Jesus under your foot. You are counted the blood of his covenant by which he was a sanctified a common thing. You consider the blood of Jesus, it's just a common thing. He shed his blood to the last drop. And that's ah, just a common thing for you. And what you, are, you have insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who say, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Again, the Lord will judge his people. He will not judge his pagan. The, pagan. the Lord will judge his own people. So that is the warning of Paul. Let us stop trampling Jesus under our feet. Let us stop insulting the spirit of grace. Grace is not the license to go and sin. And let us stop also uh, considering the blood of Jesus as a common thing. Point number seven. The kind of Christian marriage that we want in the Christian relationship is uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 22 to verse 33. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. He said, for wives, this means being supportive. So in the Christian marriage, your wife is supposed to be supportive uh, to your husband, not to the pastor. Many women, they want to submit to the pastor, and they don't want to submit to their own husband. That's not Christian marriage. You need to be supportive, submitted to your own husbands, like uh, you are tenderly devoted to your Lord. For the husband provides leadership, hallelujah. He provides leadership for his wife, just as Christ provides leadership for the church. As the savior, the reviver of the body, uh, in, in the same way, the church is devoted to Christ. Let the wives be devoted to their husbands in everything. So Christ, uh, the Christian Mary is truly the relationship between God and Jesus and the church. Once you understand it, that's why you the same way you would fight for the church, you would fight also for marriage. Now, and to the, to the husbands, you are to demonstrate love, not just to talk about love. So buy some flowers, hallelujah. Uh, buy some chocolate, hallelujah. Write a small card with nice words, hallelujah. And women, when they buy you flowers, no matter how angry you are, don't uh, beat that bouquet on the ground or don't throw it in the, in the bin, hallelujah. Take that bouquet, take those roses and smell them. They are good and say thank you in the name of Jesus and forgive and move on. So the husband needs to demonstrate as you wake up, Kelvin, this morning, make breakfast for lean in the name of Jesus. Put some sausages, those rectangular sausages, some potatoes, hallelujah. So make breakfast for, for lean this morning, Kelvin, in the name of Jesus. Demonstrate that love, hallelujah, to your wives uh, with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrates to us. His bride. Love is, a is not a passive word. It is an active word. God demonstrated his love for Paul. Said, in that when we were yet sinners, he died for us. The one that says he loves, he would demonstrate it. He would not wait for the other one to do it first. He would do it first. 
So that is the Christian kind of Mary that we want. For he died for us. So a husband has more responsibility. He needs to demonstrate his love. He died for us, sacrificing himself to make us holy and pure, cleansing us through the showering of the pure water of the word of God. As a husband, you need to know the word of God. You need to be sharing because you are the head of the home. You need to be sharing the word with your wife. It is good. Even if your wife was saved uh, before you, that's good. But it doesn't exempt you from learning the word of God and start sharing the word of God with your wife and your children. It is your responsibility as a husband, just like your, the responsibility of Christ to share the word to us, his bride, the church. Take your lawful uh, responsibility as a husband. Christ is our intercessor. He prays for us. It's for you also, the, the husband, you need to be a prayer man. Uh, a man of prayer and pray for your wife because you are now the high priest of that home and you are supposed to be the intercessor. Many men are abdicating the spiritual responsibility. That's not Christian marriage. Don't abdicate your Christian responsibility. My wife is the one that knows the word. My wife is the one that prays. No, you are supposed to portray Christ, the head of the home. Christian marriage like Christ and the church. So take your responsibility Get to know the word of God, study the word of God, and pray for your wife, pray for the children. Be the man of a prayer like Christ is praying for us. And all that he does in us uh, is designed to make us a mature church for his pleasure until we become a source of praise to him glorious and uh, radiant, beautiful, holy, without a fault or flaw. Husband have the obligation of loving and caring for the wives the same way they love and care for their own bodies. For to love your wife is to love your own self. No one abuses his own body, but he pumpers it, he pumpers it, serving and satisfying its need. That's exactly what Christ does for the church. So you also do that for your wife in the name of Jesus. He serves and satisfies us as members of his body. For this reason, hallelujah, if you do not understand those things, the way it's supposed to, to function as we've explained today. For this reason, now I want you to understand it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and lovingly hold to his wife, since the two have become one flesh. Marriage is a beautiful design of the Almighty God a great and sacred ministry or institution as we saw in Malachi 2, 11, meant to be a vivid example of Christ and his church. So every married man should be gracious to his wife just as he is gracious to himself and every wife should be tenderly devoted to her husband. This is a Christian marriage for which Valentine was willing to be martyred, to stand on the truth of the word of God. Now, Samson was not the Valentine at all. Samson was a sexually immoral person. He went first of all to marry a pagan, and then they took his pagan wife and gave it to his best man. And then he started to go to see the prostitutes. And then he now went, now he was living in the, uh, uh, he had a mistress now, it's a concubine, Delilah. Samson was not a Valentine. He was not standing on the word of God. His father said to him, are there not uh, daughters in our own tribe, the Benjamite? Uh, but if you don't find among our tribe, okay, there are the 10 tribes that are 11 tribes that are available. Can't you find any other 
Now, what does it mean for us in the Christian, in the Christian kingdom? If you are here in the UK, if you cannot find a born again Christian that is from Ivory Coast and you are from Ivory Coast, so God is saying to you, don't limit yourself to Ivory Coast. If you find someone that is from Ivory Coast like you, you find someone that is from Kenya like you, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But if you don't find someone that is from Ivory Coast or from Kenya like you, then find another born again Christian, but it must be from the household of uh, Israel, not pagans. Samson say, no, I like that pagan. Me, I just like pagans. I don't like uh, people that are in the covenant with God. He was unequally yoked. And I started to visit the, the prostitutes and they started to live uh, in the fornication. And what happened to Samson? Paul, the Bible, see, we've read in that Hebrews chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 10 that what he was doing was insulting the spirit of grace. He was trampling Jesus on the foot. He was considering the blood of Jesus a common thing. So what was awaiting uh, Samson, a fearful expectation of a judgment. And the day came where God abandoned him. And the enemy put off his eye and he died like a dog. So let us go back to Christian marriage. You are not under any obligation uh, to only marry someone from your village, someone from your country. No. Israel was not a matter of skin color either. The beauty of Israel, there were all kinds of tribes. The wife of uh, Moses was a black woman, a black Ethiopian. Uh, Joseph married uh, a black woman. Uh, so you have uh, Jewish that are Asians, you have a Jewish that are black, you have a Jewish that are European, you have a Jewish that are from the, 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 the Middle East. You have Jewish of all kinds of uh, shades. But as long as you were from the household of Israel. So you could pick. If you like a yellow, you pick yellow. If you like black, you pick black. If you like white, you pick white. If you like mixed race, two of my, my, my cousins are Jewish. They are, they are, they are, they are the Israeli army. The, the mother is Russian. The father is Congolese. Uh, they, 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 they've been there since the 90s uh, in Israel. Uh, Levi was born when he left home. He was uh, Levi was uh, five years old, and uh, he's in the Israeli military. So you have all shades. God did not care about all those things, but as you, that was the father saw Samson was say, "Don't go marry any pagan. Marry only someone that is uh, in the household of." Uh, God. Don't profane God's holy institution. Don't uh, be living in fornication. Don't be living in the one night stands and all those things that those pagans are doing. Don't. Don't be in homosexuality. That's not the way of God. God is a holy. Uh, God also does not take away our culture. I say it again. Uh, God does not take away our culture. If you want to follow our culture, praise the Lord. But as long as that culture is in line with the word of God, as long as that culture is in line with the word of God. If it is not in line with the word of God, we put it aside. When I was in Huddersfield, I was with the Pakistani uh, group, uh, cell group. Uh, the daughters were born here in the UK. Uh, all the daughters, they were about the seven of them, they were all born in the UK. Uh, they've never seen uh, Pakistan at all. Uh, what, but when time came to be married, they themselves, they did not want anyone that was, any Pakistani that was born here in the UK. They said the Pakistanis that are born in the UK, they think like uh, Europeans, so we don't want, uh, we want a true Pakistan. These are the, themselves the daughter that say to the father. So the father went uh, in uh, Pakistan, and uh, took uh, the son of, uh, of his brother. They, uh, so the two of them, two of the daughters married the first cousins. In the book of Leviticus, it is allowed to marry your cousin. So if people want to do that, as long as it is in line with the word of God, no problem. But the reason why people don't do that it is because of genetic disorder. There's a lot of genetic disease when you marry cousins. But if people ask the, the culture, we don't take away, the, if the Bible doesn't forbid it, 
we, it is not for us to come and say this, this, and that. So when they were not having marital problems we were with the three sisters, uh, one of them, when he came here, he just started to, to work, work, abandoned the, 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 the lady. He was now waiting to bring his own real girlfriend from Pakistan. So that one was not a Christian at all. But the two others, they were true Christians. There were some challenges in uh, the marriage. So we took them, uh, we sat them down, I talked to them. And today uh, the marriage uh, works. It does not mean because you married your cousin that it is going to work. No, the whole royal family, they are only cousins and cousins that have married. But nobody frowns their face at the cousins that are married, though they are fifth cousin, sixth cousin, but they are all cousins. So God could not stop it from people marrying the cousin and the church also cannot stop it. Because people, if people would continue to do that, the royal family here would continue to marry them, 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 between themselves, cousins and cousins. You can't stop it. But what God forbade in the book of Leviticus is to marry your brother or your sister, is to marry uh, your half sister. You can't do that. And the Bible study of, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, we kept the good wine for the end, we addressed it. So we don't preach the British culture, we don't preach the Kenyan culture, we don't preach the Chinese culture, we preach the word of God. And uh, the word of God, every culture is going to be filtered through this word. Whatsoever is not from God will stay on this side, whatsoever is from God will come out on the other side. My grandmother, She's a twin sister. My grandfather married the two twin sisters. She did what Jacob, my grandfather did what Jacob did. Jacob married the, the two uh, sisters, but my grandfather married the two twin sisters. Later on, in the book of Leviticus, God will forbid that kind of uh, thing. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, in days of our ignorance, God winked at us. God overlooked many things. Father Abraham married his half sister. His father, Tara, had a wife uh, with uh, his first wife that he gave birth to Abraham and his brothers. And then he married another woman that he gave birth to, Sarah. So Sarah was the sister of uh, Abraham, but from another mother, but they had the same father. That's why he was not truly really lying. He said to Abimelech, like I said to him, she's my sister. I was not truly really lying. She's my sister, truly. Technically, she's my sister, but she's also my wife because we have the same father, but uh, different uh, mother. So people were doing all kinds of things. But that was Father Abraham. But now, uh, well, how do you call it? Uh, the, when God now, God still called Abraham, he still called Sarah, he still called Jacob. But now when he came now to Moses, he said, Moses, I need to correct a lot of mess that is, in the, that is happening. So you need to stop this. What Abraham did, it was wrong. So this kind of marriage, you need to stop it. What Jacob did, it was wrong. So this kind of marriage, you should stop it. When I went to Tanzania, that this was the same thing that uh, people brought me those cases of those marriages, uh, cousins and cousin, and so on and so forth. Everybody was angry. I said, do you truly want to know the truth? I did not come here to judge those things. That's not my place. So you can keep your culture, but what I would just say that you should not do is for you to marry brothers, okay? If it is the, the cousin, you can do that. Though it has some genetic disorders and that may happen and so on and so forth, but Leviticus said that you can do that. If you want, if that, that's your culture, I did not come here to, to remove your culture. We are not trying to make uh, Americans out of uh, all believers. We're not trying to make uh, uh, British out of all believers, not trying to make a Congolese out of all believers, we are trying to make a Christians and things that God says they can God allowed if they want to continue that though God gave some warnings, let them do that. If they decide to change, they hear your, the argument, praise the Lord, you will not change the royal family, they will keep on being married between cousins. And the whole Britain will go and celebrate at the wedding of uh, William and her cousin, of Charles and her cousin. So today you know the truth. 
and the truth shall make you free. Valentine is about people standing for a Christian marriage because it is dear to God and it should be dear to you. So find a Christian husband, a Christian wife that do stand like a Valentine. He is not going to be a fornicator. He's not going to impregnate you before you get married. It is not old fashioned to be a virgin before you get married. Don't believe that lie. It is a virtue. You are a virtuous woman. You are a virtuous man. Because all your, 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 your friends are having one night stand, they've uh, known men. No. You should see yourself as a virtuous daughter of God. Because that's how God sees you. So don't feel like you are missing out on anything. You are not. And God will send you a man or woman that would truly be a man after his own heart, that would respect God's holy institution of marriage. And he will love you like Christ loves the church. And you would serve him and love him and uh, care for him as we've read in that Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to, to, to 33. We are going to make heaven on earth. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the praise. And we want to give you all the adoration. You are the Lord God of all flesh. And besides you, there is a no other God. We thank you for Christian marriage. We thank you for believers of old that decided to even stand even when they were threatened with the lives that they would kill them, they said they would stand for Christian marriage. They would not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. They would not live in sexual promiscuity. No one night stand, no bisexual, no homosexual, no lesbianism, uh, no fornication, no adultery, none of that. They would have none of that in the name of Jesus, but they will live a holy and uh, consecrated Christian marriage. And they were willing to marry in secret just two people, they would go and get married, provided they are in order with the kingdom of God. It was not about inviting a lot of people, but they defied the emperor and they married in secret. Father, at the time of COVID, many are making excuses why they cannot make the things right. Father, I pray that Christian will stand. Whether it's just two people that are allowed in that wedding hall, they would go and do the thing the right way. The way that would please God, not please men, because as a Christian, we are supposed to please Jesus first of all. His blood was shed at Calvary. Let us not insult the spirit of grace. Let us not trample Jesus under our foot. Let us not uh, consider his blood a common thing. There is a power in the blood of Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would wash us, wash all of our marriages, and give us a new foundation. Father, if our husband is not born again, I pray that we would continue to pray for him this year until he gives his life to Christ. Because that is what you want for our husband also, to give his life to Christ. So that we will be equally. We did not know before when we married. Uh, we just were desperate about marriage. We did not know the foundation of Christian marriage that uh, Valentine died for. And we married someone that was not a Christian. But I pray you would have mercy on us. And as we have put uh, the name of the people that uh, we need to pray for this year, we pray that you would arrest our husband this year, that you will be born again in the name of Jesus, so that we as a family are going to be saved all together and we are going to serve. You will know the word of God. You will lead us as a, as a Christian husband is supposed to lead the family, provide the spiritual leadership. You will be a man of prayer interceding for us as well. You will turn, in to be, uh, in turn up and be the man that God has designed him to be. And I pray for the sisters that uh, desire to be married. There are many people that call themselves Valentine, but they are sons of the devil. They are but fornicators, adulterers, uh, perverts, uh, people that want just one night stand and pregnant and leave, irresponsible people. I pray that you drive all those people away in the name of Jesus. But I pray that you send to those sisters that are desirous of marriage, you send them a true Valentine that uh, stand for Christian marriage, that will do the right thing, that will glorify God and honor that holy institution of marriage, not do abominable things and profane your holy institution of marriage. I pray, my King and my Savior, that you would give hope again, hope again to the brothers and sisters that they would rise up 
and live up to the standard of marriage in the Bible. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. Marriage is a good thing and it should be honored by everyone. And I thank you for many celebrations of uh, marriages in our midst and in our family, for our children that deliberately disobeyed after they've told them the truth. Have mercy on them. We, we don't have any control over our children. They are adults. They've made a decision to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But I pray that uh, they will come to the senses and give their life to Christ. In Jesus' mighty name. And I pray also that we would uh, share the card, the flower with our wife, with our husband, and uh, cook something nice for today. And eat some Ben and Jerry ice cream. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.